How's it going, everyone? I'd have to say there wasn't a whole lot of people growing up in the 1990s who didn't see at least one of three things on video rental shelves. A movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, dusty Nintendo games, and Tremors. Tremors hit the cinemas in 1990, and while it garnered some box office success, it was not quite as lucrative as Universal Studios had hoped. Part of this was a lack of marketing hype, in addition to the movie itself being delayed a full year. It was actually supposed to be released in 1989. Its reception was lukewarm when it finally was released, but where it had not done so great in the movie theaters, it more than made up for in an emerging market. Home Video Rentals Tremors is considered by many to be an homage to the creature feature monster flicks of the 1950s. Movies like The Blob or Creature from the Black Lagoon or War of the Worlds amongst uncountable others. It also contained an archetypal everyman element to it. Val and Earl, our two main protagonists, are luckless handymen trying to make a living in the Nevada desert town of perfection. They decide to leave, but before they can, the town is rocked by a series of mysterious deaths that culminate in a horrifying truth. There are giant, flesh-eating worms burrowing beneath the town of perfection, and they have an appetite for human beings. Aided, for the most part, by Rhonda, a local graduate student, and the survivalist-turned-monster-hunter couple, Bert and Heather, they set out to save what's left of the town's population before perfection vanishes into the dust for good. The film is full of beautiful sweeping cinematic landscapes, and accordingly there were only two sets built for interior shots for the entire movie. Walter Chang's Grocery and Burt Gummer's Basement. Having been born in 1989, I grew up with this movie. I begged my dad to record it onto a VHS tape, and so he did. The VHS tape version I watched for years was on a worn out cassette and included all of the 90s vintage TV ads and ridiculous dubs over the curse words. That tape's been lost to the sands of time, maybe swallowed by a graboid, but that's okay because I've now bought the special edition DVD. We're here for Tremors, a slice of homage wrapped in a mystery and swaddled in humor. It's a complete package, one of horror, sci-fi, romance, action. It's almost its own genre. Welcome everyone to Firearms and Film, a series where we take a look at firearms throughout the history of cinema. It's part commentary, part cinematic analysis, part education. From Burt Gummer's 8-gauge elephant gun to Earl's Colt single action, here's a list of the top five firearms in Tremors. Tired of trying to scratch a living in the hard pen desert doing small jobs, Earl and Val have made up their minds they intend to set out to make a new life in the nearby town of Bixby. What they don't realize yet is that fate has other plans. A landslide caused by an agraboid attack has blocked the only road in and out of Perfection Valley. On investigation, Earl comes across two bloody utility worker helmets. First glimpsed while a panic-stricken Earl tries to load it, I'm loving that custom paper sack gun case, Earl, the Colt single action army with nickel plating probably does fine against human beings, but it's doubtful it would do much against a Graboid. Perhaps just as well known, if not more so, than Colt 1911, the single action army is chambered in the venerable 45 revolver cartridge. This isn't the only gun's appearance, however, as later we catch our first glimpse of the thing that's been killing the locals. When Val and Earl finally make it back to Walter Chang's, they are greeted by a gruesome sight a single horn tentacle-like appendage dangling from their axle. Formulating a plan that night, the townspeople select Earl and Val to set out on horseback to warn the doctor about what's going on. The Colt 45 single action is glimpsed just one more time as they go to saddle up their horses. Before they head out, there's a dispute about who gets what gun. Earl loses, but his defeat is short-lived as Heather shows up with a consolation prize. And now for the consolation prize, a finely crafted Winchester Model 70, a classic bolt action rifle. Heather herself says that Earl and Val will need something with a little bit more kick than either the Colt or the 30-30 lever action can provide. And we'll get to that 30-30 lever action in just a minute. Heather boasts that her Model 70, chambered in 375 H&H mag, is just what they need. Looking a little jealous, Val? It's hard to blame him. So let's talk about the rifle for a little bit, then we'll discuss the round it's chambered in. The Winchester Model 70 is one of the most versatile and popular sporting bolt-action rifles ever produced. From the 22 Hornet all the way up to the 458 Winchester Magnum, it has been used by police forces, civilian hunters, and competitive shooters since its introduction way back in 1936. 
With some of its design derived from the earlier Model 54, the Model 70 has a long history of reliability and accuracy. It was used for training in the Marine Corps in the 1940s, and while it was never officially adopted as a combat sniper rifle, it did see some limited action in World War II. Now, on to the round it's chambered in, the 375 H&H mag. Developed in response to the popularity of the Mauser's 9.3 by 62mm cartridge, the 375 H&H mag that Heather refers to is a little over 3.5 inches long. That's a heck of a distance to pull a bolt if you're not accustomed to it. It's considered one of the most versatile game cartridges for hunters. Its variability in grain weight allows a shooter to be more selective in choosing a load. Typical bullet weights range from 270 grains all the way up to 350 grains, with no noticeable drop in performance. With those kinds of weights and the standard cartridge load, the impact from a single round generates in the neighborhood of 5,700 joules of energy. For perspective, 45 long colts used in revolvers like Earl's only generate in the neighborhood of about 600 joules. Of course, we never get to see this rifle fired as it's abandoned not long after Val and Earl encounter their first crab board. Poor horse. But at least Val got to squeeze off a few shots, which leads us to the next firearm. Edgar's Winchester 1894 lever action chambered in 3030. Is there really any other cartridge that a lever action rifle should be chambered in? While they're high-tailing it to Bixby, Val and Earl spot something high up on an electrical tower. It's Edgar Dean, the resident alcoholic. Assuming that he might be drunk, Val climbs up after losing a game of rock, paper, scissors only to discover the horrific truth. Edgar's dead, swarming with flies, and still clinging to his 3030. Edgar has no lines in the theatrical release, but in a deleted scene that was supposed to be the original opening, he speaks quite a bit. It's actually in this deleted scene that we first see the Winchester 3030 lever action as Edgar pulls it down mere seconds after a graboid attacks his barn. Catching a whiff of the graboid, a terrified Edgar flees. Winchester rifles are also known as the rifle that won the West as its repeating lever action made it popular with lawmen, settlers, and outlaws alike. Specifically, the 1894, while bearing superficial similarities to older models, is mechanically improved. Developed by John Browning of Machine Gun in M1911 fame, the last we see of the Winchester Model 1894 in Tremors is when it's discarded right after Val shoots a tentacle and uses it to no effect to fend off a full-size worm. It might have been similar circumstances that led a man to prop his own Winchester against a tree in Great Basin Park, also, coincidentally, in Nevada. Well, Heather, I can't blame you, because I'd be just as confused too if I saw my neighbors hanging out on the roof of the local general store. Bird and Heather have just come back from searching for any signs of the creatures they think are responsible for the deaths and perfection. They've been out of contact with everyone for a while, so they really don't know what's going on. While Bert's trying to figure it all out, Heather turns on what has to be the world's loudest vibratory cleaner. This drives the graboids into a frenzy. After raising Val on the radio, Bert's just as confused as before. I mean, I don't think there's an easy quick way to tell someone over a CB radio that a massive subterranean worm with tentacle tongues is burrowing in their way and they have to get to higher ground. Bert! They're under the ground! They're under the ground! Heather senses that something is up, but Bert's hesitant. Before they even understand what's happening, the cinder block wall to Bert's basement begins to flex. The pair realize that something's up, or down, at this point. Bert's final communication to Val is cut off midway just as the graboid bursts through the wall. Thinking that the two survivalists are done for, Val hangs his head in despair. That is, until he hears the crack of glorious gunfire echoing across the desert landscape. Back in Bert's basement, we're treated to the fusillade of the century. Round after round, bullet after bullet, laces the air, tearing through the graboid's body. But this thing has thick skin and is built like a living tank. Bullet riddled and flare gun blasted, the graboid still refuses to give up. The two throw everything they have at it. There's lots going on here, so at the risk of breaking top five firearms stringent gun count rules, let's rack up a list of the best boomsticks. A Remington 870 shotgun. 
first sold in 1951, chambered, more than likely, in 12 gauge. A Winchester Model 1200 with a pistol grip configuration used by Heather as she undertakes the repulsive task of blowing apart one of the tentacles. HK91 Semi-Automatic. Nothing more awesome than ripping into a monster worm with round after round of 762 by 51 millimeter. AR-15 style Colt and 556, the civilian model. Heather shoots it till it's dry, then shouts for more magazines. Sig Sauer P226 alongside a Ruger Red Hawk, dual wielded by Heather as she tries to fend off the worm fiend. And finally, an M8 flare pistol with a grab boy taking it right to the tonsils, used by the armed services until 2002. For the actual official firearm number four, however, we have a monster gun to slay a monster. A William Moore & Company's double-barreled rifle lovingly crafted with a wooden stock and packing the potency of two 8-gauge solid lead slugs. It should be noted that in reality, firing a gun in a manner like this would probably result in the incredible recoil kicking the barrel into the user's face. The recoil of an 8-gauge is certainly not something that one controls without a good cheek weld and some fortitude. Michael Gross's portrayal of Burt Gummer takes us into account in the sequel Tremors 2 Aftershocks with a different set of double-barreled rifles that, while not the same one featured here, warrants the same kind of precaution. It's this gun that finally offs the graboid, just like blowing out a candle, as they say. A really big candle with tentacles and halitosis. The last firearm on our list is here simply because it's one of the more humorous scenes in the film. All of our protagonists have set out in the bulldozer across the desert to make their way to the mountains, but don't quite make it all the way as the graboids have dug a trap. What they can't lift up, they'll simply bring down. A room in the semi-trailer that they were hauling behind the bulldozer, Earl, Rhonda, Val, and all the rest utilize an array of firearms to ward them off. Finding themselves on what amounts to a sinking ship in the middle of a sand ocean, Val and Earl come to the realization that this might be the end but Rhonda's none too keen on becoming worm food, so she devises a plan, using the bombs to drive the graboids away and make a safe run for the rocks. But Melvin is reluctant. Bert, seeing that the only way to get him moving is to give him a little confidence boost, hands him a Ruger Red Hawk. Turns out, though, that the revolver is empty. This is probably a smart choice on Bert's part, as Melvin has zero of muzzle and trigger discipline. The Ruger Red Hawk is a double or single action revolver reinforced and beefed up in both frame and cylinder to make a bulkier, stouter firearm capable of handling hotter loads than the comparable 44 Magnum and 45 Colt pistols of the time. First sold in 1979, it's a fairly hefty gun, weighing in at just over 3 pounds. Not quite as heavy as the Desert Eagle Bird has holstered, but with something designed to take custom powder loads, you want to have that much weight to dampen the recoil and stabilize the pistol. Tremors is just good, overall, cheesy, gory fun. It takes itself lightly, as does the sequels. The Sci-Fi Channel was going to produce a new series with Kevin Bacon and supposedly a plot was filmed, but interest dwindled and nothing was done. Thankfully, Michael Gross has continued interest in the Tremors series and is coming out with a new film. Regardless, this was one of the first movies I saw and probably a prime example of what kinds of films we aim to cover here at Firearms in the Film. Thank you for watching.